from Korea to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the United States Army is on the alert to defend our country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Captain Carl Zimmerman. In the past, we have seen and heard reports of our fighting army in action. Man land weapons using firepower to defeat the enemy. But there is another very important phase of warfare. It has as its target, not the body, but the mind of the enemy. Its mission is to influence the thoughts of the enemy soldier and thereby weaken him. And at the same time, it brings to the no man's land of communism, the voice of the United Nations Command and the voice of truth. This part of the big picture is psychological warfare. It is words and ideas and carries on where the weapons have left off. Somewhere beyond these mountains is the enemy. His strength has been sapped by steady aerial strikes. and heavy artillery barrages. But he is still a long way from being defeated. He still has his will to fight. How can we weaken that will? How can we defeat him? By physical force? Yes, that's the most effective way. But there's another force applied in combat that we generally don't think of as a weapon of war. That weapon is words. Yes, in a situation like this, words are weapons. Now that the enemy has had a strong dose of our military power, the impact of words may provide the final persuasion. Words that go something like this. Soldiers of North Korea, you are surrounded. Your comrades are dying. You will die next. There is just one hope. Leave your positions tonight. This is psychological warfare, or at least it's one phase. As a weapon of war, psychological warfare is no novelty. It is as old as war itself. But the use of this force as an integral part of combat has now taken on new forms. And it works in many different ways. The printed word, and the spoken word. The Army's role in this kind of warfare is best described by Brigadier General Robert A. McClure, the Army's Chief of Psychological Warfare. Modern war has become a struggle for men's minds as well as for their bodies. Today we face an enemy who spends enormous sums of money and manpower all over the globe in an attempt to subvert the thinking of the people of the free world, to confuse, to divide, and ultimately to subjugate. This effort goes on day in and day out and it crackles about the heads of a world audience of untold millions. It is an ideological war, and in its own way, it is more of a total global war than any we have ever known. The enemy carries out this determined campaign of propaganda, subversion, and infiltration, not only during the Cold War, but also during the present hot war eruption in Korea. We, as well as the enemy, carry this ideological struggle right into the front lines in Korea. The North Korean government and the Chinese communists tell their own people that the United Nations Command carries out bacteriological warfare. They are told the United States is the aggressor in Korea. They are told that the communists are the champions of peace. A constant stream, a distortion of facts, misinterpretation of events, and outright lies pours from the propaganda machinery of the worldwide communist conspiracy. It is important to note that the number one target of this campaign of hate, vilification, and dissension is the United States. There is nothing that we do or say that is not immediately twisted, distorted, or misinterpreted to suit the ends of communist propaganda. Needless to say, we're not allowing the communists to foist this incredible fraud upon the world. 
It is up to us as a nation to checkmate this violent propaganda, which is cleverly calculated to destroy us. Within the military, as in Korea today, this effort becomes an integral part of military operations. Regardless of what the communist propagandists tell their own people in North Korea and the North Korean and Chinese communist armies, we see to it that they know the truth. Significantly enough, a truth that they would never know if they did not get it through our own efforts. By news sheets, leaflets, radio, and loudspeakers, the true facts of communist aggression, duplicity, and totalitarian methods are kept before these people. Their leaders are uncomfortably aware of the fact that the truth does get out, and it is the truth that they fear. The bare, unvarnished truth does significant damage to the North Korean and Chinese communist armies. It causes dissension among their troops. It causes defection, desertion, and surrender. To us, psychological warfare is another support weapon in the arsenal of the military services. When it is properly used, in cooperation with the other elements of military power, it contributes the more economical attainment of a military objective. In other words, it reduces the uh, amount of manpower and material expenditure necessary to do a given job. On June 25, 1950, within 48 hours of the outbreak of fighting in Korea, the United Nations began waging its psychological battle in support of our military objectives. First operations paralleled the early techniques of World War II. A specially equipped C-47 prepares for a psychological warfare mission into enemy-held territory. The plane is aptly named, for it carries an interpreter who will broadcast to the Reds as the voice of the United Nations. A truck is backed up to the storage compartment of the C-47, and cartons containing surrender leaflets are loaded into the plane for eventual release over enemy territory. At the same time, this loudspeaker will send the interpreter's voice reverberating through the hills to urge the Reds to surrender. With all the leaflets aboard, the plane takes off. It is one of several planes being used in Korea for this purpose. As the plane nears the drop zone, the cartons of leaflets are unwrapped so that they'll be ready for dropping when the plane reaches its target. Proper and humane treatment for any of the Chinese or North Koreans who throw in their lot with the United Nations forces is promised in these safe conduct passes. A similar method was used in the early stages of the Korean campaign when our propaganda was of a defensive nature and was designed to uplift the badly sagging morale of the South Koreans. In addition, an interpreter now delivers the same invitation and assurance over a loudspeaker. With this dual bombardment by leaflet and voice, the enemy receives the full effect of our psychological warfare. From the time our military effort shifted from offensive to defensive, psychological warfare has stayed abreast of the United Nations offensive action. Result, desertion, dissension, lowered morale, and surrender. Our propaganda was beginning to pay off. Meanwhile, back in Washington on January 15, 1951, psychological warfare was established as a special staff agency. This move had far-reaching results. In civilian colleges and universities, long-range recruiting and educational programs were instituted. Laboratory experiments and research led to new and better psychological warfare. Reserve units were recalled and several new units activated and at Fort Riley, Kansas, a psychological warfare training school was established. 
Here, recruits with specialized backgrounds were taught the nature, methods, and techniques of propaganda and its dissemination. At the same time, plans were launched for the permanent training center, now located at Fort Bragg. Meanwhile, like the fighting in Korea, psychological warfare operations went into high gear. At general headquarters in Tokyo, staff planning and supervision are handled by the psychological warfare section, while the operating unit in Tokyo is the first radio broadcasting and leaflet group. This group conducts strategic propaganda and supports the tactical operation in Korea. The effect of our psychological warfare in combat is described by Colonel Earl H. Chapman of Rivera, California. Communist propagandists continuously accuse us of indiscriminate bombings in North Korea. They conveniently ignore the warnings which psychological warfare gives to those people in and near military, uh, communist military installations. But the people of North Korea have come to learn the truth. Through warnings by radio and leaflets, these people know hours ahead of bombings and know when to evacuate. They have come to have a respect for that sense of decency which is found among the free-thinking people of the world and which is not found under the communist regime. Telling the truth is the only way in which to influence people who have become so unfortunate as to come under the domination of the communist regime. Currently broadcasting in Japan and Korea are 32 radio stations. For about four hours every evening, the stations deliver propaganda that thrusts at the communists in North Korea with facts. Radio presents these facts in any number of ways. Perhaps its most rewarding form of expression is news. For news is ready-made propaganda. And to an enemy, denied access to outside information, it's as welcome as food and water. Radio's principal advantage is that it can reach remote areas and reach them quickly. So that one program can be repeated and thereby reach a larger audience, it is often recorded on discs. Or on tape. The same show can be rebroadcast at convenient times in different areas, and it may be relayed by fixed or mobile transmitters in the field. In addition to news, Radio employs other techniques to attract the maximum audience. For example, messages from prisoners of war are broadcast, assuring their families that they are safe and well cared for. These awaited messages induce the enemy civilian to turn his set on, and to make sure he'll keep it on, prisoner of war messages are spotted at different times during the week. Often, a radio program takes the form of a drama, such as we see now. Dramatization is close to the Oriental mind. For ever since his earliest schooling, the average Far Easterner has been taught by having things acted out for him. Carefully planned and rehearsed, these dramatic offerings play heavily upon the emotions. There is no strict evaluation of radio's achievement, but with a constant repetition of the free world's point of view, it is certain to have a cumulative effect upon the enemy nerve. This mobile radio broadcasting van in Seoul is one of many similar units set up across South Korea which help to carry the message of truth behind enemy lines. They perform in numerous ways as relay stations for larger networks, as a stopgap to fill a temporary void, or to lend direct support to the tactical operation. Captain Fred Laffey of Lawrence, Massachusetts, is in charge of these broadcasts, which reach millions of listeners in Korea and China. Every day are commentaries, interviews, dramatic shows, special features, and most important of all, our news broadcast, being to the people behind the Iron Curtain our most potent psi war weapon, truth. Even communist officers listen to these programs because they know that that's their only source of accurate, factual, unbiased information. At the radio broadcasting and leaflet group central printing plant near Tokyo, 
are produced all strategic and many of the stock tactical leaflets. Every leaflet has a central idea or issue, which is exploited by any number of themes. Leaflets stress such points as the United Nations stand against aggression, the historic friendship between the United States and the people of China and Korea, the unfulfilled promises of communist leaders, and the horror of death away from home and family. Leaflets also stress the humane treatment of prisoners of war. And finally, the methods of surrender. In the selection of a theme, many factors must be considered. Does it capture the interest of the audience? Does it hold that interest? Above all, does it establish confidence in what we're saying? A theme has been selected. The theme is needless death. First, an artist prepares a dramatic piece of art and the theme comes to life with a grief-stricken mother visualizing the pointless death of her soldier son. Two versions are prepared, one for the Koreans and one for the Chinese. By using overlays, special care can be given to the varying details of the soldier's gun and uniform. Even a small inaccuracy may create a wave of ridicule among the enemy and destroy the effect of months of previous propaganda. The text that goes with the picture is first written in English. With the help of an interpreter, it is then translated into both Korean and Chinese. Short, punchy words that make their point quickly and fan the soldier's feeling of despair. He has fed the thought that he will soon join the swelling victims of needless death. The final draft is then reviewed. In many red units, offenders found reading UN literature have been shot by the firing squad while their comrades were forced to look on. Finally, the leaflet is approved for production. One index of the leaflet's effectiveness is the elaborate effort the enemy spends in guarding against it. As a weapon of psychological warfare, the leaflet is invaluable. Chinese and Korean soldiers are especially impressed by realistic drawings and photographs. Moreover, the leaflet is far more permanent than the spoken word, for it can be read and re-read. After copy and artwork are okayed, they are photographed and processed. Plates are then mounted on the presses. Although they are warned by their leaders that UN leaflets are impregnated with germs and will rot their hands or make them blind, many prisoners of war have been found to carry them secretly. And the size of the leaflet is such that it can be easily concealed. Leaflets are then packed in rolls so that the maximum number can be carried in one load. They are then placed into bombs. Normally, each bomb accommodates about 22,500 leaflets of lightweight paper. Bombs are systematically loaded into trucks and transported to the airfield. This B-29 is about to range deep into enemy territory. It is a fighting craft equipped to take care of itself against enemy attack.
We can only estimate roughly how many airmail copies of Needless Death will reach the individual enemy. Nevertheless, overall we do know that leaflets will scatter the seeds of dissension, unrest, and possibly surrender. In Korea, tactical propaganda is handled by the Psychological Warfare Section of 8th Army. A large share of intelligence is gained by interrogating prisoners of war, done by G2 teams. Special Psychological Warfare interrogation teams conduct closer examinations of the prisoners and poll them. Often they speak freely and offer important facts about the conditions they left behind them in their own front lines. This information, when evaluated and interpreted, indicates how effective our past propaganda effort has been. It also supplies the basis for further speaker broadcast and leaflet themes. Since themes are often individually tailored to meet an existing frontline situation, the l and company must meet that situation before it changes. So that our propaganda can take advantage of the psychology of the hour, tactical leaflets are run off on the company's own presses, which can operate in buildings or in vans. Leaflets are disseminated in two ways. First, by air, as we have seen, and second, by artillery shells. Specifically adapted, these 105 millimeter shells can pinpoint selected targets and reach troops in the most localized areas. Leaflet shells can also strike at combat zones in which aircraft would be impractical. In addition, these message-filled missiles are able to penetrate densely wooded areas. Leaflets are printed a color in vivid contrast to the terrain they are aimed at. They are best fired at twilight, since it is still light enough for the enemy to see where they land, yet dark enough to cover him when he gathers up the literature, which is going to him, Air Express. The loudspeaker platoon of the loudspeaker and leaflet company operates directly with the frontline unit. These loudspeakers are used to get across timely messages to the enemy in close proximity. Furthermore, illiteracy is prevalent among the Chinese and North Koreans, so the spoken message makes our meaning thoroughly clear. The hazards met by the men operating these loudspeaker units is described by Sergeant Leon Nelson of Poland Springs, Maine. I do remember one incident that pretty well typifies our silo operation on the front lines. I think it was last winter that uh, our Cywar team, our loudspeaker team, helped set up its loudspeaker and microphone and sound equipment on a ridge overlooking a company of Chinese communists which were completely surrounded by United Nations Command forces. Well, once the surrender appeal was underway, the broadcast was in progress, uh, scores of uh, artillery rounds started pouring in and uh, mortar. The uh, Chinese communists obviously were zeroing in, and uh, needless to say, once the broadcast was completed, uh, our Cywar team didn't hang around for long. And uh, incidentally, neither did the company of Chinese communists. Now, from what I've told you, you may think that our loudspeaker men work under rather adverse conditions. They do. But as any Cy warrior will tell you, these are the risks that the frontline infantry soldier takes every day. When more mobility is desired, loudspeakers are mounted on tanks. The physical force of the tank, coupled with the psychological force of the loudspeaker, is an ideal example of psychological warfare's most effective performance. A similar combination is the airborne loudspeaker. Mounted in a tactical aircraft, it can reach enemy territory, inaccessible by ground loudspeakers and it can cover both civilian control and guerrilla areas. Because of their nostalgia value, the voices of Korean and Chinese women are often used. Some enemy soldiers feel that if a woman can fly over their positions, the communists must be losing the war. In the time that lies ahead, still newer methods of propaganda are growing out of research and experimentation. But the job of carrying the truth to the people goes on all the time. By loudspeaker in the streets and by radio in the ruins of bombed homes, a bewildered people listen, learn, hoping for something better.
the voice of the United Nations carries on where bullets and shell fire cease, bringing hope to many for the first time. For psychological warfare and its media of expression are dynamic, always learning sure ways of breaking the spirit of the enemy. The value of psychological warfare today is described in Tokyo by Colonel J. Woodall Green. Psychological warfare has been well established as a modern military weapon. Its usefulness in cooperation with other military weapons has been thoroughly proven in Korea. The target of psychological warfare is against the enemy's mind, while the other weapons, their target is the enemy's body. Facts are the ammunition used by Cywar, and the enemy's job is to keep unpleasant facts from their people. Therefore, our job is to break this barrier of the communists and to get the truth and the facts to the communist people. In the front line, Cywar works against the enemy's morale to make him suspicious of his officers and to make and to cause him to worry about the conditions back home and thus to lower his fighting efficiency and to make him think of surrendering or deserting. These are the Psy War soldiers. They alone do not win victories in combat, but they have a potent weapon which they use to the utmost to support the infantrymen, and the tanker in inflicting decisive defeat upon the enemy. Yes, in modern warfare, our military leaders are finding that words and ideas are highly effective weapons. Next week, our cameras will take us to Korea for interesting stories and anecdotes that seldom reach the public eye. This is Captain Carl Zimmerman inviting you to be with us then. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the U.S. Army in cooperation with this station. You can be an important part of the Big Picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army. This is war. War and its masses. War and its men. War and its machines. Together they form the big picture. Welcome to the big picture. I'm Captain Carl Zimmerman. The big picture is a report to you from your army, an army committed by you, the people of the United States, to stop communist aggression wherever it may strike. The big picture traces the course of events in the Korean campaign through first-hand reports of our combat veterans and through film taken by combat cameramen of the Army Signal Corps. These are the men who daily record on film the big picture as it happens, where it happens. Today, the big picture brings into focus the entrance of the Chinese Reds into the Korean War. You'll see our soldiers battling winter cold as well as communists. You'll see how we save thousands of lives by the quick evacuation of our wounded by helicopter. And you'll see a display of weapons, the finest weapons in the world, the weapons of your United States Army. And you'll hear from Corporal Bill Carpenter and Major Joseph Donahue, who saw action with the Army infantry in Korea. And now, let's go back to October 1950. <laughs> Oh, 
On 20 October, United Nations troops have seemingly sent the bulk of the communist forces fleeing in defeat toward the Manchurian border, 100 miles to the north. From west to east, U.S., British, and South Korean troops are pursuing the disintegrating communist forces. By 27 October, South Korean troops have reached the Manchurian border on the Yellow River near Chosan, and other U.N. forces have advanced against virtually no opposition. But on the same day, a sudden, unforeseen factor changes the entire course of the war. Chinese communist troops cross the Manchurian border and help the North Korean Red drive back UN forces. Chinese communists fighting in Korea are estimated at 75,000, with another 500,000 across the border in Manchuria posing a more serious threat. By 8 November, UN forces have been driven back considerably. But on this date, another unforeseen event occurs. Chinese and North Korean communist troops suddenly break off contact with United Nations forces and fight only rear guard delaying actions as once again UN troops drive toward the Manchurian border. On 20 November, another United Nations unit reaches the Manchurian border. This time it is a United States unit, the first US outfit to reach the border. As United Nations troops continue to advance in other areas, much depends on what the huge Chinese army will do next. The first sign of the growing threat from China. Captured in East Coast battles 50 miles from the Manchurian border, these troops belong to Chinese Red Army divisions in the combat zone. Chinese and North Korean captives are brought out of the hills to Wonsan and Ham Hung. The Chinese are better clothed than their North Korean comrades. With their quilted uniforms, they wear tennis shoes wrapped in layers of burlap, making a kind of shoe pack. In contrast with the Chinese, the North Koreans are in rags at this stage of the war. The prisoners double time across the Wonsan airfield. They are being marched to landing craft, which will take them to Busan. Since the beginning of the war, the North Koreans have suffered 460,000 casualties, including the dead, wounded, and captured. 130,000 red prisoners have been taken at this time. Two women are in this group. Prisoners of the UN are treated in strict compliance with international law. Over 25,000 men have been wounded in Korea, but less than 2% of these men have died. Less than two men out of every 100 wounded. The main reason for this low death rate is the speed of treatment. This is a battalion aid station First stop in a wounded man's swift journey through the echelons of medical aid. The average time spent at a battalion aid station is only 72 minutes. Many types of transportation are used in evacuation to the next echelon, the regimental collecting station. Specially equipped jeeps are used in rough terrain near the front. But if the roads are serviceable, ambulances may be used. Air evacuation is fastest of all and enables certain medical channels to be skipped. Behind the collecting stations are division clearing stations and mobile hospitals. Medical care takes manpower. It takes several men to carry a litter. Evacuation procedures are similar throughout the services. The Navy provides medical service for the Marines. The results of speed have been shown by a hospital at Pusan. Out of 18,000 wounded brought in during the first three months of the war, only 40 men died. Field expedient. 
Wooden stands instead of tables speed the movement of litters and allow the eight men to work at hand level without bending over. There is nothing fancy about these hospitals. They are there to save lives. The death rate of wounded in World War I was 8%. In World War II, it was 4.5%. Korea's approximate 2% death rate is a milestone in military medicine. Many casualties are evacuated by air to Japan. In a parachute drop, such as the 4,000-man jump north of Pyongyang in October, the parachutist's own medics jump with them. They carry enough medical supplies to last until contact is made with friendly forces. But even before contact is made, the injured may be evacuated from the drop zone by air. Helicopters with specially constructed containers carry the wounded out. Many a man who could not have survived a jeep or ambulance ride over the rough roads of Korea owes his life to these evacuation planes. Japan is the next stop from the hospitals in Korea. Japan is only an hour and a half away from Korea by plane, but less than half of the incoming wounded remain here. The rest are moved on to the United States. Many men wounded at the front lines in Korea have found themselves back in the United States three days later. Our Army helicopters are saving thousands of lives in Korea. Corporal William Carpenter of the Army 7th Division is with us to tell us a little about them. Bill, you saw a good deal of the helicopters, didn't you? Yes, I did. First time I seen a helicopter evacuation was up in North Korea when <clears throat> my buddy got hit. Well, uh, it so happens I helped bring a, another wounded person down off the hill to the aid station. And while I was down at the aid station, I met my buddy. Uh, the helicopter had come in, and uh, they were getting ready to put my buddy on the helicopter. Well, when they put him on, he, uh, he asked the pilot whether or not he was going to get air in there. And the pilot told him that he was going to have fresh air and heat. Mm -hmm. Did they jog him around, did he? No, sir, it didn't. Good smooth ride back to medical aid, huh? Yes, sir. Well, now, you were with the 7th Division, Bill, and the drive north, that went pretty rapidly, and then about the middle of November, something happened. What was that? Well, sir, that was the whole change of the war. The Chinese had jumped in, and uh, at that time, we were in reserve. We didn't know much about it, but uh, about a week later, we had our first encounter with them. At that time, we found out that the Chinese were better trained or smarter in their tactics. They had better firepower than the North Koreans. Better soldiers all around, huh? Yes, sir, they were. Well, you saw a lot of winter weather in Korea, Bill. How were you able to keep warm? Well, most of the time we were on the move, uh, and we kept warm that way, but uh, after we stopped, we tried building fires until it was dark. After dark, we'd climb in our sleeping bags, and that's where we'd keep warm. Mm -hmm. Keep dressed in those sleeping bags, ready to for any attack? Yes, sir. We kept our clothes on all the time. Uh-huh. Well, how about our weapons in this extreme cold weather, Bill? Well, our automatic weapons, they're, they get froze up quite a bit during the winter time, so you have to keep working them most of the time at nighttime. But uh, our M1 was always there when we needed it. You like that M1 pretty well, Bill? Yes, sir, I do. Mm-hmm. Well, if we must build weapons for war, Bill, let's build the best. And our Army ordnance, our American industry and labor are doing just that. At Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland, members of the American Ordnance Association meet for an annual exhibition put on by the U.S. Army Ordnance Department. They see both U.S. and foreign equipment. A Russian 122-millimeter gun. a Russian 85-millimeter anti-aircraft gun, 
a Russian 152-millimeter howitzer. U.S. and foreign vehicles are also shown. A Russian T-34 tank turret from Korea. A U.S. M-26 tank, waterproofed and equipped with a snorkel breathing device for use in boarding operations and landing. A new waterproof Jeep. Greater electrical capacity for radio equipment has been added to this Jeep. A new six by six, two and a half ton truck is equipped with a snorkel breather and waterproofing. Next, the visitors watch demonstration firing. Recoilless rifles give the infantry artillery firepower. Comparison firing, 50 caliber machine gun. An aircraft machine gun. Other guns are demonstrated in separate and comparison firing. Those are the weapons and machines of your United States Army. Now let's talk about the men who use those weapons and machines. The men of the infantry. And no one is better qualified to tell us than a man who served as a commander of a rifle company in Korea. We want you to meet Major Joseph Donahue. Well, Major, tell us about this rifleman. The American rifleman has been called by many names. A mudslinger. Uh, Doefoot, Dogface, uh, these names uh, are not names of a derogatory nature. Uh, we of the infantry consider them names of honor. Well now, it takes a good deal of know-how to be a rifleman, doesn't it? It uh, certainly does. Uh, the Army goes to great pains uh, to technically train a man uh, on weapons and tactics. He learns not only to shoot his weapons, he learns how they function, how to take care of them, and how to keep them working. Well, now, when this man knows his weapons, he knows his fighting tactics, does he know why he's fighting? When they first uh, go to Korea, it is sometimes doubtful whether they fully realize why they're fighting. But after they see some of the things that happen, they lose some of their very close buddies. Uh, they see the results of some of the atrocities then uh, they know why they fight. And he knows that this thing he's fighting is a definite threat to his way of life, right? He certainly does. Well, let's talk about the morale of the infantry in Korea. What was it like when you were there? The American infantryman is a tremendous institution. Uh, there is always one person in the squad or in the platoon who can make light of or make a joke in the most serious of situations. Uh, for example, in the midst of a motor barrage, uh, one person will always pipe up with a remark such as, uh, a fellow can get hurt out here doing things like that. And uh, it's funny because actually you're looking for something to laugh at. You bet you are. Well, now, from all you've told us, Major, this rifleman is a pretty important gent, isn't he? He's very important. If you would stop to realize that the armored the air, and the Navy do their jobs so that this infantryman uh, may accomplish his mission. The infantry is the queen of battle. Well, now, Major, let's watch the Navy as they give support to the infantry. On 15 November, in the Sea of Japan off the coast of North Korea, Navy Task Force 77 was operating in support of ground action in the drive toward the Yellow River. Winter weather is closing in. And naval operations are hampered by high seas and extreme cold. The air 
aircraft carrier Philippine Sea receives ammunition, mail, and other supplies hauled across open water in a cargo net. Such operations are difficult in rough weather. The first load is ammunition. It is quickly taken in and passed back into the carrier's magazine. At this time, Navy and Marine carrier planes were taking the fight into every corner of North Korea below the Manchurian border. Carriers were also in operation on the west coast of Korea. On both coasts, the Navy's task of mine sweeping was continuing. During the resupply operations, the Philippine Sea is hit by a snowstorm. Despite the weather, a tanker comes alongside and refueling gets underway. As refueling and the transfer of supplies continue, the seas get higher and higher and the storm becomes a veritable blizzard. This is not an unusually heavy storm. It is typical winter weather in the northern sea of Japan. breaks out snow shovels on the carrier. Although air operations are halted during the height of the storm, flights from snow and ice covered decks are becoming routine. The planes are covered to protect them from the storm. Combat maintenance of the Corsairs and Panther jets continues through the storm. The Navy reports the typical Korean temperatures in the northern area average 11 degrees above zero during November and five degrees below zero during December. A more familiar kind of winter combat starts on the carrier deck. This is a severe test for carrier planes. During World War II, most carriers were in the milder climate of the South Pacific. At Hagerstown, Maryland, the U.S. Air Force demonstrates its latest cargo plane. This is the Fairchild XC-120, a packed carrier plane with a detachable fuselage. Doors are designed like clamshells. Cargo capacity is 20,000 pounds. It carries 64 combat equipped troops or 36 litter patients with four attendants. The pack has detachable wheels. Four electric drum hoists raise and lower the pack from the carrier. A central control operates the release and locking mechanism and the pack lowers to its own wheels. Then the hoist lines are detached. The five-man crew of the carrier consists of pilot, co-pilot, radio operator, navigator, and engineer. When the pack is separated from the carrier, it is easily towed away. This pack can be used to house various types of shops, headquarters units, emergency hospitals, weather stations. It can also be converted into a tanker for carrying fuel. Ball socket connections lock the pack to the carrier. A rubber tubing seals pack to carrier by compressed air. On the carrier, the four ball socket locks operate simultaneously. The carrier is powered by two Pratt & Whitney engines with reversible pitch propellers. 
maximum speed is 250 miles per hour. The ceiling is 25,000 feet. Landing gear consists of four retractable dual wheel units. It's electrically operated, and the main or rear wheels have brakes. This airplane opens a new field for aviation. The cargo pack is to aircraft what the trailer is to highway trucks. In Washington, the Department of Defense displays the winter uniforms which have been issued to United States troops in Korea, and what the Chinese communists are wearing in North Korea's sub-zero temperature. A captured quilted uniform is compared with the U.S. winter uniform. Unlike the Chinese, the U.S. cold weather uniforms are designed on the principle that the best protection against cold is several layers of clothing. In North Korea, U.S. troops are fighting in one of the coldest battle areas in U.S. history. Army and Marine winter uniforms are compared. The uniform for both services is the same, with one exception. The Army wears a pile line jacket for ordinary cold, while the Marines wear a battle jacket inside a field jacket. Wet and dry cold weather equipment, which has been sent to U.S. troops in North Korea, is the end result of much practical experimentation such as the exercise Sweetbriar cold weather maneuvers held in Alaska in February 1950. With icy winds blowing down from Manchuria, bringing snow and sleet storms, our troops are fighting in almost Arctic conditions. Two types of cold weather boots have been designed. Rubber shoe packs for wet cold, felt line for dry cold. The importance of winter clothing in North Korea was emphasized when some units outdistanced their supply lines, went without full cold weather equipment for a few days. Basic and innermost layer of the U.S. cold weather uniform is long woolen underwear. Over these are worn two pairs of trousers, a flannel shirt, a high neck sweater, a jacket, and in extreme cold, a pile-lined parka. There are two types of mittens. The regular mittens have a trigger finger. Mittens worn with a dry cold uniform have no trigger finger, but they have cheek warmers. Following the separate layer principle, three pairs of socks are worn, each pair being successively larger with the boots large enough to take three pair comfortably. Experimentation in refrigerated laboratories, as well as in the Arctic itself, has given U.S. troops newer and better ways of fighting the weather. In this parka, with fur-rimmed hood, the U.S. fighting man is equipped to endure the coldest weather. Those were the events that comprised the big picture from October 20th to November 20th, 1950.
Our thanks to Major Joseph Donahue and Corporal Bill Carpenter for being with us. Next week, the big picture will show how the army in Korea escaped the trap of the Chinese communists. You'll see how we made the enemy pay dearly for every inch of ground gain. You'll see the Army's 7th Infantry Division on the Manchurian border. Our troops celebrating Thanksgiving Day along the Yalu River. The evacuation of the Hungnam Beachhead. And you'll hear from another Korean veteran, an Army soldier who saw, as it happened, a part of the big picture. This is Captain Carl Zimmerman inviting you to be with us then. Thank you.